is new? Yeah. Yeah. It's 7 p.m. I will call the meeting to order. If we could please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and good evening. This is the January 9th, 2023 business meeting of the Milford Board of Education. Um, Ms. Griffin, can we have a roll call for attendance, please? Catherine Ailing. Here. Adam Dion. Here. Megan Doyle. Here. Andrew Fowler. Here. Tracy Irby. Here. Emily McDonough Souza. Here. Gary Pellicetti. Here. Una Petrosky. Here. Cindy Wolf Boynton. Here. And Susan Glennon. Here. Are all 10 members present. Thank you. All right, we have student reports. My notes say the job, the law goes first. We have um, Cole and Aylin, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you and good evening, board members. It is a pleasure to be with you once again. I hope you all had a great break and a happy new year. I will begin tonight with some law amazing news. Senior captain of the gymnastics team, Cliff Coddington, will be featured tonight as the Scholar Athlete of the Week on News 12. Today marks the first day of auditions for our spring musical production of High School Musical. Before break, Law hosted an event called Law Miss Mingle and Jingle before holiday break as a social emotional learning event the day before break. Students had a half day schedule and they got to visit themed rooms which they previously picked out on a Google form. Some of the options were pick, pick up basketball or spike ball, painting and poetry room, arts and crafts room, the friend zone, ping pong, karaoke, and more. After this, students got to attend our annual student for staff basketball game with a halftime show from our cheerleaders and some of our staff. For Lawmas this year, we hosted our annual door decorating contest where each advisory class decorates the area around their door. Our winners were named last week. In academics, forensic students began their final crime scene investigation, which is a full mock-up of a fictional crime scene. This requires students to process and analyze evidence in order to determine what happened and who committed the crime. Anatomy and physiology students participated in their first dissection in December while investigating the nervous system. The TLC has received a grant from the Milford Education Foundation for the project Coding for Creativity. Three Q robots and accessories were ordered this week to complete the grant. These robots will be a part of our major space. The World Languages Department continues to work collaboratively with the middle school teachers discussing vertical alignment, articulation, and curriculum revision as more Spanish classes open up at the elementary school level. We are excited to offer proficiency tests to French 5, Spanish 5, and Latin 4 students and the seal of biliteracy for those who succeed. We are reviewing the program of studies and are finishing a new World Languages video for the Jonathan Law Elective Fair. The next Model UN trip will take place tomorrow, January 10th, and our astronomy class will take a trip to Forns Planetarium on January 11th. On December 21st, the Jonathan Law Band, Choir, and Orchestra took a trip to Harborside and West Shore Middle School to perform to students. In law sports action, congratulations to Liam Fedigan for breaking his previous school record in the two mile with a time of nine minutes and 53 seconds. Liam also sets another school record in the one mile with a time of four minutes and 31 seconds at the Armory in New York City this past week. He placed 18th out of 31 runners at the Invitational from the Tri-State area. The indoor track SMR team also completed, also competed at the Armory and set a new school record of three minutes and 44 seconds, which qualified them for states and nationals. Also, congratulations to John Neider for being selected as a Gatorade State Player of the Year. Boys basketball is off to a great start this year with a 5-1 record with their win over Shelton this past Thursday. Law Gymnastics moves to a 1-1 one one record and wrestling moves to a 7-6 record. Law soccer goalie Sabrina Wallace sets a new school record for having the most career saves at 502. Her gloves will be on display in our trophy case. Our update from the school counselor in college and career. Seniors are steadily receiving college application outcomes. Every Friday, an update email on college acceptances are sent out to faculty and staff from the College and Career Center so everyone can celebrate these student successes. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all and we look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have Connor and Venice from Foreign. Good evening. All right, good evening, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the holiday break and are looking forward to the new year. We had some great things happen in the foreign community over the course of the last month. 
So in December, students wore green to support the Sandy Hook Promise, and our school raised $414.78 for the organization. We thank our students and staff for their participation and awareness involving such an important event. Natural Helpers also adopted a family from the Milford Youth and Family Services. Students were able to bring in items such as clothing, towels, and soap to donate to local families in need during the holiday season. Our gratitude goes out to all students who supported our local community. Warren also held their spirit week from December 19th to the 22nd. On Monday, teachers attempted to dress like students, and students attempted to dress like teachers. It was a fun event for all. On Tuesday, we had our winter wear, and students and teachers were instructed to come into their, uh, come into school in their best winter attire. On Wednesday, we had anything but a backpack day, and students brought items to school, um, such as strollers, suitcases, and baskets. <laughs> Lastly, Thursday was our holiday wear day, and students wore clothing representing their favorite holiday. Last month, the Foreign Music Department also had 19 students accepted into the CMA Southern Regional Honors Ensemble. This included nine students from the choir, seven from the band, and two students from the orchestra. We're so proud of these students um, for earning such a tremendous achievement. Foreign's Teaching and Learning Commons also recently created the Foreign Learning Commons Lowdown. The goal of the Lowdown is to pro uh, provide students and families with an insight into digital tools and technology tips that will assist students with everyday academics. The website also includes teen podcasts to assist the mental health of our students and young adult reads for the environment. <coughs> <clears throat> the Giving Table Club re uh, recently prepared several dishes for a local family in need. This included cornbread, chili, and vegetable white bean soup. In addition, the club also prepared a meal for the East Side Firehouse of Milford as a way to say thank you for their service and protection. This meal consisted of baked ziti with ground beef peppers, um, garlic, and onions. We thank our club members for their dedication to make an impact on the local Milford community. And lastly, on December 20th, during period 7, Foreign seniors gather in the cafeteria to enjoy hot chocolate and cookies. While there, students also created crafts that were donated to the local senior center uh, to help spread holiday cheer. Thanks to our foreign seniors for helping out other seniors. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to speaking with all of you again in February. Hello, everyone. It's great to be speaking with you again. So Connor mentioned the Spirit Week that we held, but I also wanted to add about our incredible pep rally. There was a snowflake game around the school, posters decorating the gym, merch thrown into the crowd, and many games. We had a holiday trivia rewarded with gift cards. We had a wrapping, pap wrapping paper fashion show, and then a huge game of teachers versus students basketball, which the students loved cheering on their friends and their favorite teachers. Students in Mrs. Rowley's and Mr. Williams' civics classes visited the state capitol and Supreme Court. And while at the state capitol, students were visited by Representative Kathleen Kennedy, and learned about the working process of our state government and were able to tour the house, chamber, and engage in how the legislative process works at the state level. Journalism seniors Azam Hostetler and James Allen produced a video for Fox 61 Student News that, a that aired on a Friday morning in December. Please join us in congratulating Ms. Hallie Zuckerman on her new position as our full-time athletic trainer. Hallie has worked part-time at Foreign High School since 2018. A 2010 graduate of Foreign High School, Hallie continued her studies at Keene State, where she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in athletic training in 2014. Mrs. Dotson's Art for Seniors classes mix pop culture with an 1800s style painting, creating pointillism landscapes using markers. Pointillism is a technique in painting which small distinct dots of color applied in patterns to form an image. Forever Friends celebrated the new year with a crazy game of bingo, scavenger hunt, a word search, and conversations about resolutions before the break. Everyone had an absolute blast. Joseph A. Foran's Interact Club successfully volunteered their services again this year, along with our city's fire department to help organize all the toys that were collected, the Margaret, Margaret Egan Center for this year's Choice for Tots campaign. Um, in the science department, students in forensic science began processing their final crime scene. Like law, students will use skills learned throughout the course to sketch, photograph, process, and analyze evidence to figure out what happened to the also, in Mr. Wade's chemistry classes, students have been analyzing what makes things glow and burn colors. They looked at plasma discharge tubes to determine which specific wavelengths can make up colors for some of what they saw in the lab. Using <coughs> spectroscopes, like the astronomers, they can determine what elements are in space from afar. Lastly, foreign boys basketball won the Platte Tech Holiday Tournament, and Joe Gaetano received the tournament MVP. Thank you all for your time. We hope you had a wonderful holiday season, and we can't wait to see you again next month.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you students. Thank you. Feel free to head out and get on with your evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. The next item on our agenda is public comment. Or do we have anybody in the audience who'd like to make public comment to us this evening? Okay, seeing none, I'll dispense with the public comment statement. Move on to the chair's report. Um, so happy new year, board members and staff and members of the public. Uh, we begin our budget work this evening with Dr. Kutaya's presentation of a broad overview of her budget proposal to us. So as a reminder, we set aside three budget workshop dates for, um, for the board to take a deeper look at the proposal in collaboration with administration um, to uh, get all our questions answered and um, take a deep dive into the, into the details. Um, the workshops are scheduled for this Wednesday and Thursday, and they will be held virtually via Zoom uh, and live streamed on, the, uh, on YouTube for the public to view. Um, public comment is on the agenda. Um, if anybody has any, any questions, um, we're going to follow the same process we used last year. It will be noted on the agenda. Um, so we will have public comment at all of our meetings. The workshop next Wednesday, the 18th, at which time we anticipate, I anticipate we will vote. We will hold that in person here in the boardroom at 7 p.m. Um, again, that will also have a public comment time before we actually vote. Um, and just a reminder that members of the public can always email their comments to the board as well. So I did ask you all to submit any questions that you have in advance so administration has time to formulate the response. So. Um, just a reminder to do that as soon as possible. And as we go through the process, if you have additional questions, just e email them to me as quickly as you can so that I can um, send them along to administration and they can have a response for the next workshop. Um, then once we wrap up our budget work, the document goes to print and must be in the mayor's hands by the end of the month. And then the process moves on to the public hearing before the Board of Finance, uh, after which time administration and I present our funding request to them. So I don't have those dates yet. It's at the beginning of uh, February is typically when the public comment is um, in front of the Board of Finance. So with that said, do we have any um, liaison reports? Okay, seeing none, I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Kutaya for Lennon. her report. We'll start with the budget presentation. Thank you. Yes. So I um, like to think of the budget process uh, that we engage in every year as a public dialogue about what we hope for our young people and staff in our schools, uh, particularly this year, as um, a, as a school district, we by no means are immune to the economic pressures and challenges that we experience as a state uh, and as a nation. Um, I am looking forward to having that conversation with you first, as our board of education. Uh, I assure you that this budget is a numerical representation of what our plans are for kids. And that is how I really like to think about uh, a budget. While we are going to be talking dollars and cents, and we'll be trying to uh, negotiate a bottom line on what this will all cost us, I just want to remind us that this really is a dialogue, while numerical in me, <coughs> about what our plans are for students and staff members. And I can assure you that any time we talk about plans for students and staff, we always start here. Um, you see this frequently and often because that is the level of consistency and coherence that exists in Milford Public Schools. That we are about the vision of the learner. We are about building the capacity for high quality instruction and we are about relationships. These three pieces guide everything we do. And I hope that you will find in the numerical representation of our plans the evidence for this throughout the budget. What we anchor to additionally are the commitments that this board adopted. <clears throat> These nine commitments, which I will not read to you, you're familiar with, 
has, part, has been part of our public dialogue. Uh, throughout our budget process, we harken back to these commitments. Additionally, these are the goals that were adopted by the board for five years through 2026. These directly align and are um, quotes from the vision of the learner. So just in these first couple slides, I hope you're already seeing the uh, intertwined nature of the work. <clears throat> What I will not read to you, but uh, should be familiar to you, are the budget priorities that you considered and adopted on October 10th of 22, just a couple of months ago. These are the priorities that direct our work as an administration in developing this budget. And these are also the assumptions you adopted on that same evening in October. These are the assumptions that we, uh, on a day in October with a lot of homework and research, try to forecast out. I do want to remind you that oftentimes we're planning for um, things we'll put in place into a school year, sometimes 18 months ahead of time. And so um, with the crystal balls that we are given in our roles, we create assumptions based on what we think is going to happen post-pandemic, in transportation, uh, the impact of inflation, um, utility costs, special education, some uh, specific uh, staffing. So these assumptions, just to refresh your memory, cover all those categories and are uh, included here in these couple of slides. Before we look forward, I want us to pause and take a moment to be reminded of what your decisions around um, adopting a budget and the support of a community has yielded. We annually do this. We take a moment to take a look at our accomplishments. Every year we celebrate that at the end of educational career of a senior year by holding three ceremonies, yes, only three ceremonies this year, in person. We graduated 401 students at three high schools in Milford Public Schools. The way we celebrated that is by having 166 of those students graduating with honors. And these are the post-secondary plans broken down by students, as you see on this slide. Anytime I have an opportunity to remind you that these percentages, we hope, will fluctuate from year to year. Because in our efforts to create a career paths starting in middle school, we know that the plan post-secondary will grow greater in difference for our young people, the better we prepare them for making that decision. So here you see the, um, the degree of individuals who are going to two and four year colleges, as well as those going straight into the uh, employment or even making decisions about going into the military. Our job is to get kids ready for whatever that decision is and whatever is right for that student. This is the breakdown of the 154 students named as AP scholars. One measure of success for a school system. We also, um, just as a reminder as a part of the budget process, um, are responsible for 100, uh, sorry, not 100 million, 1.1 million feet of building space, 179 acres of grounds to keep, as well as 485 classrooms. Here are just some highlights from projects that we have been able to either get started or have accomplished. Uh, Pumpkin Delight ground bait breaking for the renovation there, you'll see the picture there on the right. The teaching and learning commons, um, that is a continuous year over year process of getting those renovated up to date to emulate what our kids are doing in 2022, not those of the libraries that likely you and I um, uh, lived and learned in. And then uh, this is a picture of the foreign high school track, uh, which if you remember back to Pat Bradbury's presentation was a very involved process to get to this beautiful product. Here are a couple other projects to remind you about the renovation, the replacement of playscapes, hardened vestibules, uh, the redoing of the cafeteria's um, front storefronts, uh, re-roofing projects, particularly at har Harborside. Part of the scope of our responsibility in a budget also is to consider the transportation of young people. We transport 3,980 students every day. So some of these numbers is just to remind us as a board the scope of our responsibility. In the 21-22 school year, we served three quarters of a million meals. 
a lot of uh, food being served to our young people in the form of breakfast and lunch. In the area of communication, this is critical for our school system. We continue to ask ourselves how can we better meet the needs of our community. We um, recently made some um, updates to upcoming news and events. We uh, have made it into the world of podcasting. The school system has its own podcast. And we are now present on Instagram. So just expanding and trying to get to all of our audiences. And we know that as a school district, we can't do this alone. And this slide represents really um, a, a fraction of the individual organizations, groups, uh, community-based groups that we work with in order to meet the needs of not only our students and staff, but our families as well. So I'm not going to read all of these for you. Uh, likely, um, you, have, you know about these if you're reading the, the updates that we send to you. These are just highlights of um, the, the great moments that we experience. Uh, and if you follow us on Twitter, you are seeing these as well. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, just individual kids doing great things. And it's because of the opportunities that we, we are able to afford them in our school system. You have these slides in front of you. So I just also want to remind you, this slide may or may not be familiar to you because uh, you saw it a year ago. And these are the system improvements that we presented to you or proposed to you in our community that we would engage in. Uh, these system improvements all represent either uh, initiatives that we have started and are in progress or have been completed. So you'll see many of these pieces that were championed all throughout the budget season last year. You've heard a little bit about, as well, intentional play and executive function. In fact, in a few short couple of weeks, we are going to be putting all new furniture in kindergarten and classrooms. So that is going to be coming to fruition, uh, a dream come true uh, that has taken uh, quite a bit of time. Um, so some of these pieces, pre-K-4, already in place, the world language, um, the uh, phase two of the middle school schedule, enrichment for all, new courses were developed for seventh grader, seventh graders. The math pilot in process and tonight you'll hear a little bit that we're ready to make a decision because that's how we make program decisions here in, in Milford. We uh, pilot, we test out, we research, we gather information, we gather data and that's how we make programmatic decisions based for our young people. I won't read this list because there's a new one I want to read to you in just a few minutes. Uh, these are some of the things you supported as well. Remember the drum line I talked to you about last year? There it is in living color in that picture. Um, some of the uh, investments that you made, we were able to celebrate together at convocation. You see there the STEM labs, the libraries, um, the nursing course, which I will talk about again this evening. A little bit more here as far as um, investments that we've made in picture format. And happy to have already shared with you, we engaged over 100 teachers <coughs> in season three of HQI Live, and there is um, already planning happening for season four to be held in July. And that will that season four planning is supported in this um, budget that I'm proposing to you. A little bit more on executive functioning and intentional play with our little people. Anytime I can throw pictures in of cute kids, I'm gonna show them to you, particularly when we're talking budget. Okay, so let's get to the 23-24 budget based on um, what we know we have already accomplished and we want to build upon. There are great things already happening in Milford Public Schools. So this budget proposes a building upon the foundation. The proposed budget before you is the amount of $106,488,950. Or in other words, an increase of 4.392% from last year's budget. Um, so let me just pause for a moment and just go ahead and comment that this is a number larger than our community is used to see. Let's just go ahead and say that out loud, okay? Um, and we have come to this number with great reservation, actually. We've done everything in our power to provide a balance between what we feel like our responsibility is to advocate for the needs of our young people and staff members 
while at the same time being sensitive to what we know we as a community face, just like the rest of our nation, post-pandemic economy. There are some things that were out of our control, which I will share with you this evening. And there are some things that we feel like were uh, efficiently proposed enough that we can continue with not a lot of financial investment. We'll talk about that as well. So I realize that this is a larger number than usual, but there are some factors that contribute to this number. But I thought because there are a couple of you new uh, on this board, um, and it's always good to have a refresher, to go through the process of the basically a budget 101 very quickly, okay? So Edward Deming the, uh, once stated, the process you use to make decisions and build budgets unavoidably shapes the types of outcomes that are produced. So pause a minute. We are making decisions basically through this budget process. We've already made so many decisions before getting to this evening. And starting this evening for this board, based on what you did, uh, um, voted on in October, there'll be many more decisions that you're making through the budget that actually relates to the outcomes of the school system. And that's why I started the slides with reminding us that we have commitments and goals that you adopted. And it's our hopes that this decision and budget process can be clearly linked to those plans. Deming also reminds us that following the same old process is likely to produce the same old results. And that's why, ask any administrator in Milford Public Schools, the budget process is a rigorous one with me. Because every proposal requires a backup, not just financially, but programmatically with lots of questions on how does this align with the mission, vision, and goals of the school system. And every administrator is rolled back to zero. Every department, every school building is rolled back to zero. So for example, if you had 300,000 in that line item last year, you don't start at 300,000. You start at zero. And if that line item is now proposed at 350,000, there are a lot of questions around why and how did you get to that number. So please know that we roll everybody back to zero as part of our process. And we start with these guiding pieces. I'm not going to repeat them. But these are the guiding principles. Mission, vision, goals, priority assumptions, and the three core pieces of our work. So let's stop here for a second. We take those guiding principles, and then we create a multi-year strategy. So what's it going to take to get to our goals, to realize the vision of the learner? There's district strategy and school level strategy that are aligned. From that strategy, we determine year by year what are our priorities for student and staff members based on the needs. The kids that are in front of us right now what are their needs? And I will propose that sometimes that's hard when we start consuming big numbers because our mental model is when we went to school. Right? When we went to school, we didn't need that or we did it a certain way. I will ask this board, as I will other boards I speak in front of, to consider the current conditions of schooling the current needs in teaching and learning. And this board has been great to dialogue with us on that. SEL and mental health is nothing like it used to be. <clears throat> we have greater needs in our, in our classrooms, in our buildings, in our community, in our homes. Just one example. Based on the priorities of the students and, young, and staff in front of us, we determine what are the appropriate programs and initiatives the ideas, the improvement, right? And we ask ourselves, then what are the resources and budget we need to make that happen? And we make sure that that is then aligned with the line items where we're spending the money is aligned with the guiding principles. And it, and it becomes a cycle for us, okay? 
There are four big pieces driving the number part. Let me go through those four. Salaries and benefits, and this is more delineated when we get further into the budget, and I will call it out when we get to that slide, okay? Salaries and benefits, huge number. Out of the 4.39%, salaries and benefits represents 3.43 of the 439. What does that represent? It represents a net increase of 9.8 FT, certified FTEs, full-time equivalents. Let me remind you that a couple years ago when we made a decision to spend ARP and ESSER money, that we knew we were creating for ourselves a mini funding cliff. We were very cognizant that we weren't going to create a big one, but we decided that it, we would take advantage of the ARP, considering the SEL and mental health needs of our young people in front of us. And while we already wanted to hire school counselors, we thought, hey, we have ARP ESSER, Let's go and onboard them all at one time and bring them back into general fund over the course of the next three years. So here in this budget before you is 4.0 school counselor positions and 0.8 supervisor for equity and engagement. That, those 4.8 positions are coming off of our Besser and into general fund. That's something we knew was going to happen two years ago. So for some, there may be buyer's remorse because the bill has come in. But for us in the school system, the school counselors are invaluable. There, it's been a couple of short years, but we, don't, we can't see doing business without them now. So it is time to fold them into the general fund. What you'll also see in this 9.8, and there is a page um, in the book that you can see the breakdown. I think it's page 9, right? Well, we've been looking at so many numbers, but it's in there. Uh, you'll also see um, we needed to add some FTEs this year to respond to enrollment, and you'll see that in the form of 2.0 FTE. We baked in a 1.0 elementary uh, FTE in the event that we need that. Um, over summer when registration occurs. In fact, that might be a low number, but um, we have 1.0 in there. We're adding fifth grade in um, world language at the elementary school. Uh, that requires a 1.0 FTE. <clears throat> Our um, enrollment in the CNA course, the Certified Nursing Assistant course, um, is just <coughs> booming. And so we want to respond to student interest and needs. And by the way, it's part of our career pathways. Uh, so there's 1.0 FTE there. Um, there and a couple others where we can go through when we're looking at the budget specifically. We also have 2.2 FTE non-certified um, and we have added costs on the benefit side. A big part of this 3.43% also includes the first year of a uh, new three-year teacher's contract. Um, it comes in at about a $1.6 million hit in the first year. So just for a moment, if we did nothing new or different, nothing new or different, just in the teacher's salaries alone, we'd be looking at about a 1.6% increase. And we have many other employees. We have custodians and paraprofessionals and secretaries and administrators albeit teachers union is the largest and that contract will be the largest I just want to put into scope numerically that with doing nothing new we are already looking at a 1.6 percent increase okay moving on to the second big piece of, of this uh, impact on this budget is contracted services and tuition special ed tuition and special needs uh, contracted services that comes out to about 0.32 percent of the increase in transportation we have rising fuel costs everyone's experiencing that personally and professionally that's about 0.31 percent of our increase and finally we have some new state mandates in the area of HVAC evaluations and feminine products um, every three years now, according to legislation, we are required to conduct a full evaluation of our HVAC systems. 
The first one is due January 1st of 2024. We have costs being quoted to us ranging from 130,000 to half a million. And we're waiting on guidance from the state. And you'll see uh, our budgeting in there for this is quite conservative uh, when it comes to this evaluation. And I realize there will likely be lots of questions about this, but it is legislation that requires us to install uh, feminine product dispensers in all of our elementary, middle, and high schools, starting with third grade and all female bathrooms and one male bathroom in each school. I'll answer questions on that, not tonight, but at a future meeting and provide you with the legislation as well, okay? So that is a budget item that I realize has lots of tentacles of questions and concerns, okay? So I just wanna let you in, into my head for a moment because sometimes um, folks may interpret the role of a superintendent of saying yes to everything, okay? And that's like, that is not the case at all. And I have actually a slide of a list of things we said no to tonight. Okay, um, but this is a, uh, a way of looking at budgeting that is, I think, nicely laid out by the district management group that I use in my head as I'm making decisions. And I want to walk you through and give you some examples. So this is a matrix that considers cost with impact, right? So when you're, when you're thinking about large budgets like the ones that school districts normally have, there are a lot of requests that are coming. Then, there's not a single request that actually was a bad idea. They're all really great, well thought out professional ideas. But I go through a process of um, considering cost and impact. So let me give you a big cost and big impact, which is the priority or refining category for as DMG defines it. School counselors for me is a big cost, but has a huge impact on the entire student body. So while it's a lot of money, it goes a long way. So I propose as a board considering that mental model. How much is this costing and what's the impact, okay? Let me tell you something that we sunset a, a couple of years ago that was huge cost, and that was NWA testing on all kids, kindergarten through 12. Huge cost, and it was our determination conclusion that it was a low impact. It didn't give us a return on that investment as far as the data that we needed on kids learning. So we sunset that. We actually discontinue things. We actually stop spending money on things like that as an example. And a high impact, low cost, an example of that recently is the wingman program. Wingman is a short investment, a couple of years, they come and do a trainer of the trainers, and quite frankly, the kids take over and they run with it. It's a huge impact on our middle schools, and it's a low cost investment. Now, I realize communities really want, a, likely, a school budget that is a high impact, low cost, right? It doesn't exist a school budget is gonna have a little bit of all of these. And hopefully, not a lot of low impact things, okay? So I wanted us to consider that sometimes it's not just the wow sticker price, that our eyebrows may go, oh, that's a lot of money. I want us to consider the impact as well, okay? So just think about that as you're consuming these line items. So what's happening differently next year? What is the 0.18%, by the way, of this budget on system improvements? We're going to uh, round out elementary. Next year, we can proudly say that we are one of the very few school districts in Connecticut that has a PK-12 system of world language. We are offering PK-12 uh, Spanish. So next year, we uh, will hopefully hire an additional Spanish teacher to make that whole. We want to add to our classroom libraries in K-3 because of changing curriculum. And we want to um, ensure that this science-based experience will occur for all third graders next year that we're piloting this year, which is the one to the um, Audubon here at Milford, okay? Uh, the pilot program in the middle school math, uh, we are hoping to adopt. Um, 
We are going to purchase new ELA books to align with new curriculum, uh, new world language libraries to align with curriculum. We're purchasing some robots for the middle school, purchasing some instruments for two out of the three uh, middle schools to make them whole in alignment with the other. At the high school level, new ELA books, new world language books. Uh, we have a pottery wheel strategy. Um, it's come to our attention that foreign has had pottery wheels, law has not. There are now students at law that are interested <coughs> in using the pottery wheel. They're kind of expensive, so we're going to start with one pottery wheel at law and build our way up to getting more there. Okay? And that's a, an example of responding to student interest and need. Um, again, another example is the additional CNA course I talked about. Uh, our um, seniors, the, I remember one of the first conversations I had with a group of high schoolers in my first six months entry plan. Um, mm. They said at the time, we max out at Spanish five, sometimes in junior year, and we want another Spanish um, option in senior year, and so here we are finally making that happen, that we're going to offer Spanish conversation and culture um, for those students who either finish the courses through Spanish five or as an elective. And it is time because we have outdated uh, AP physics and statistics books. District-wide, we are continuing our replacement of safety security cameras and radios. And as you remember, um, Ms. Capaza presented to you the HR uh, revamp. Um, so we're revitalizing that department and making some investments there for the benefit of all of our staff members. So I'm going to let you consume this without reading it to you. This is a slide that shows you where we are in 2324 in our curriculum cycle. I'll give you a minute to review it, okay? So I'm going to answer two questions that um, you're not asking me, but I'm, I'm hoping you will. What is curriculum? We should all know that, right? It is what we want our students to know and be able to do at every grade level. So by the end of that grade level, throughout that grade level, it's what students should know and be able to do consistently, no matter what school they attend. Okay? So that's the what is curriculum. Why is it important for school districts to have a curriculum writing cycle? You don't find everybody that has one. In fact, way back into the early education research, they have found over and over that a sign of a, uh, an effective school system is that that can ensure a guaranteed curriculum. So why have a curriculum? Because it provides, one, consistency and coherence across the school system. Two, it ensures that you are making plans for every kid in the system. So students who are at grade level, there's a plan. But it allows our staff members to also create a plan for those who are not at grade level or above grade level. And so I was once asked in my tenure here, in my five years here, can you believe that? Five years here, <coughs> asked, why are you going so fast? Actually, some days I don't feel like we're moving fast enough because kids in our school system only have one time to be a third grader. They only get to be a third grade once because next year they're in fourth grade. And if we didn't provide them with the highest level and most effective grade three experience through a guaranteed curriculum, they don't get another shot at that. And that's why we have a review cycle that occurs every seven years so we can continue to make it better and better. So if we hit pause on this, which actually we had to do during the pandemic. So in my tenure, we've already done that. I'm not interested in pausing or slowing down the curriculum writing cycle. Because one part of the cycle depends on the other. So year three implementation, purple, is dependent on the writing cycle in year two, fuchsia, right? If you're not writing in year two, you're not implementing in year three. So you're backlogging a bit. And now you have a domino effect on how many kids you're impacting, right? So it's really important to continue to have this cycle moving. 
And Dr. Fetting and her team are brilliant on organically responding to um, readjusting the map depending on legislation or resources or publishers or availability of teachers. Because here's the beauty, if you don't know this, teachers in Milford rewrite the curriculum. This is our curriculum. It's not something that was purchased in Wyoming. I didn't say California or Texas. <laughs> it's our curriculum based on state and national standards. It's responsive to our kids. And that's why we write curriculum every year. So people think focus means saying yes to the things you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all, according to Steve Jobs. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are, and you have to pick carefully. So we did get an opportunity to say no and not yet to quite a few things. So here are some of the things we said no and not yet to. I won't read the list to you, but I will point out that if I brought everything before you, every great idea, we'd be looking at a 14% increase. That's where we started back in November. And if I added Pat Bradbury's requests, it would be 21.5%. Well, we know that buildings and grounds are always much more expensive and the list is always long. So while 21% sounded like a greater, bigger number, it's not fair. 14% in the non-facility grounds uh, requests is what was before us. Um, and that is what makes it even more difficult to try to get down to um, a place where it is economically feasible and actually program, program implementation. There's no way actually that a system can do everything that they were asking for anyway. So to be fair, uh, we had to look at a multi-year plan on many of these things. And I'm happy to take questions on these um, items as we go through the process, okay? Another way that we looked at this budgetarily is we asked ourselves, what can we pay out of ARP and ESSER? So we also took a look at what the proposals were in front of us and said, hey, the ViewSonic boards that we're really needing, ARP is a great place to pay for those. So we're able to get those in all elementary classrooms. Every elementary classroom, eight schools, have a new ViewSonic. If it's a learning space, it has a ViewSonic board in it. That's a huge accomplishment for a school system. I don't want us to miss that moment. Not many systems, ViewSonics are the most up-to-date, cutting-edge, interactive tool in classrooms. We're working on completing that, that um, project at the middle school. I won't look behind me to get a yes or no from Mr. Giancolo, but um, I know he, we're working on completing the project at the middle school. And then we have the high school to talk about. Now that's, that's, that's a bigger, a lot more classrooms there, so we'll need a plan for the high schools, okay? Um, so some of these things, we I know that there was some money, I don't want anyone to be confused, for kindergarten flex furniture um, in the general fund that you approved. Um, but it turned out to be not enough, so we used some art money, and we decided to round out the project by adding pre-K. So these are some of the things that we moved over to the ARP ESSER to help um, fulfill the requests that were before us. Okay. <clears throat> So here's some of the um, savings that we realized in 3D object codes, almost $150,000 there. That really doesn't represent all of the um, rolling back of monies we did. So uh, there is another um, piece here that I'll show you on uh, another slide that will really represent it. But here, if you want a visual of the 4.392% uh, broken down, it's exactly what I just uh, shared with you on the four drivers, but in visual format. So if that's 4.392%, then here's the breakdown, okay? Not new information, just another way to look at it. So we uh, very typically have this historical graph in the slides. Uh, you will see that this number uh, is similar to um, increases that we had about 10, 11, 12 years ago. Um, just underscoring again that I realize that our community is accustomed to lower increases, uh, but we've already talked about all the fact factors that impacted that. So here is the budget request for the last um, number of years. Uh, here is the breakdown of by object code. It is typical for an education budget to be around 75 to 80% salaries and benefits. That is 
very average. We are a human capital industry. We do most of our work and our business through people. 20%-ish is everything else. And even if you take that 20%, you're looking at facilities and transportation. So you can't cut transportation if you want to roll back things, right? Buses have to roll. You have a contract on that. And we have fuel costs. You have special education, tuition, legally and morally responsible for meeting the needs of students with special needs. So when we start talking about um, making cuts to this proposed budget, or even that that may be proposed from you to the community, if we're starting to make some rollbacks in some areas, there are certain places, only certain places you can go before it, it doesn't hit educational programming. So we'd have to have that dialogue on strategically where we would go if we are looking at different uh, scenarios with this budget. So here's a slide I was talking about. If you take a look by object code, you'll see that the first five object codes, salaries, benefits, contracted services, facilities, and transportation are all large increases. In the other support and educational supplies and equipment, you see some reductions made across the system and then minimal increases in tuition and educational support. So this chart also underscores once again what we were facing in building this budget. So ending on uh, just a reminder that we have incredible things happening for young people and that this budget builds upon the foundation of high quality instructional practices, educational learning experiences for young people that we hope to continue and, and grow on as well. And I know that as I started that this conversation will uh, reinforce what this board's commitments and goals are. And we look forward to, as, as an admin team to respond to your questions um, and see how we can move forward in continuing to build upon the foundation that has been set for young people. So thank you for entertaining this conversation and look forward to it continuing. Thank you, Dr. Kataya. Do you remember board members get me your questions? Okay, let's jump into calendar. <laughs> Ms. Glenda, do you want to do a motion before we, uh, I have some new information to provide, or do you want to have If you have no information to provide, let's uh, that first? do that first, please. Okay. Um, so a couple of uh, different elements, God bless you, of information. We heard from um, the registrar voters today, so I did want to put some dates on your uh, radar. Um, not meaning you have to take action this evening, but at least it's uh, out in the public so we can discuss. Um, so they sent us dates on potential primary dates and definite election dates. Um, and that means something to our calendar because um, they use our schools. And we uh, typically close our schools when these things occur. So on September 12, 2023, there's a low probability of a municipal primary election. That's a regular school day, but it's low probability to me means not highly likely. Okay. Another day, obviously, the municipal election is on November 7th of 23. We already have that marked as professional learning day, so students will not be in the building. This is the date that likely uh, could present a problem. Highly likely presidential preference primary election on April 30th of 24. So if that were to occur, we would likely need to make that a, um, not a school day for students. Right now it is a regular school day. And then the other two dates I have uh, impact the 24-25 school year, so I won't share those just yet. Um, so the less likely day of impact is September 12th. The more likely day of impact is April 30th. Both are regular school days for us. That's one piece of information that I have to share with you. <clears throat> Another piece of information, we were asked at the last meeting when we had a first read to 
do some uh, research on what surrounding towns uh, spring break was. Um, so I took this in the perspective of a couple of things. One, um, our surrounding towns. Two, uh, where do I, our staff members live? Um, I think was at the crux of that concern, having different um, spring break for, um, let's say, a staff member's home life, personal life, and one professionally. So we did some uh, database uh, analysis, and we were able to come up with some numbers I think might be of interest to the board. Um, in Milford, we have staff members that live in 58 towns out of 169 in Connecticut. And 243 certified, so this remaining of the data is about the certified staff. 243 of our certified staff live in Milford and work in Milford. That's, that's great. It's almost half, right? Um, so when I asked, when we took a look at other towns and where our, our staff live, um, we have 54 staff members who live in Orange. We have 36 staff members that live in Stratford. We have 26 staff members that live in Shelton. We have 41 staff members that live in West Haven. We have 18 staff members that live in Trumbull. 19 who live in Hamden. 14 who live in Brantford. So you see some of this problem. That's not just surrounding towns. Now I'm off to Brantford to look at where they have spring break. So let's now go to those towns for a minute. Brantford has not started their work on their calendar, so they were unable to share with us um, their spring break. Hamden has not started their work on their calendar. Um, Orange has spring break April 15th through 19th. Seymour has, I don't think I gave you Seymour, but we have 13 members there, sorry. Seymour has their break April 15 and 19. Stratford has 15 and 19. Shelton has April 8th through 12th. Trumbull has April 8th through 12th. And Wallenford has April 8th through 12th. And West Haven has April 15 and 19th. So when we took, I took a look at um, surrounding towns and towns where most of our staff members were, we'd have to have spring break either April 8th or April 15th. And ours is proposed to April 1st through the 5th. Um, I, don't know how, I don't know how to make a proposal to you on should we go with the 8th and 15th if we're gonna be responsive to staff members. But my recommendation to this board stands because in um, December of 2018, the first few months I um, was on the job here, I was approached by the faith community and I was asked to um, consider having our spring break after uh, not to include Holy Thursday and Good Friday but afterward. Okay. So what we decided to do was we decided to conduct a survey of our, our staff members and our families so both staff and families had an opportunity to answer. And the question we proposed to them is um, what should we do with spring break? Should we um, include it within with the Friday, Good Friday, or keep it as we have, or um, keep it as we have, including Good Friday, or do it after Easter? And 70% of families and staff members all said uh, keep it around Easter. And so we decided to be responsive to the faith community and make it afterward. So my recommendation to the sports stands: I want us to keep the um, calendar, spring break in the calendar uh, for April 1st through 5th. Um, I don't propose a change to that. Um, and I don't, I don't know how we would chase which spring break we would consider understanding that our staff live in 58 towns in the state of Connecticut. So I don't, I don't know where, would I go to Stratford West Haven? Would I go to Shelton? Would I do to Brantford? Would I go, but I, the next largest community where our staff live, certified staff, is Orange. But that's only 54 staff members. It's not even like a large majority. So 
if I'm going to honor, if I'm going to use a numbers game in this, 243 of our certified staff live in Milford. So I think um, I know that my recommendation to the board stands based even on this um, research that we conducted. And that's all the inf additional information I have, Ms. Glennon. Okay. Um, just to clarify, when we um, surveyed and you 70% wanted, um, so 70% wanted Good Friday to stand apart from the week off. So they didn't um, want it to be during the week off. That's they wanted really us to keep spring break in the same um, general vicinity. They didn't want it like separated. We, the question was worded, should we keep spring break in within that week? So the question was having Friday and then the following <coughs> week versus just keeping Good Friday as not being part of the week. Does that make sense? So right. we used to have Good Friday be part of the week that we were off. That was our practice, right? right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, um, Mr. Um, Pellicetti? Yes, uh, Dr. Kastaya, was MEA brought in specifically? Did you meet with MEA on this? No. Okay. Um, may I ask why? Uh, I think the calendar is an administrative um, function. Um, I, I share the calendar with MEA ahead of time. Okay. Um, and we meet once a month every two weeks, so there are opportunities for us to discuss. Okay. I'm just saying when I was a local president that the superintendent always asked me to come in and discuss calendar with him or her as we moved along. Um, I do have issue with the faith community having input into our calendar for all those obvious reasons. Okay? Just want to be on the record with that. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Ms. Doyle? Um, I agree with honoring what our teachers, staff, and everyone administrative have said in our community. Um, just based on the numbers of what you're saying is, it's probably about 200 people who live outside, obviously, 254. There's also the assumption that everyone has children who are, who are living outside our community that we have to worry about their school system. So I think we need to focus on the 243 that live in Milford in the students that are focused on here and based on what that information is going forward. I understand Mr. Pichetti's, uh, Pichetti's concerns about that, but I think they're two separate concerns that we honor the community and that's most important at the end of the day. And I think it's also easy for us to consistently say going forward, the week after is generally when we will be continuing these dates. Other concerns or questions? Uh, Ms. Petrosky, um, you're the the basis of um, moving of <coughs> excuse me of having it right at after Easter is based upon something that occurred as a survey in twelve eighteen December of the eighteenth. So to be clear, we traditionally had spring break, which included Good Friday. Mm -hmm. So I didn't create a revolutionary new calendar upon my arrival. So just want that on the record, okay? Yeah. Um, but we conducted a survey asking uh, more than just spring break, Columbus Day, um, winter break. In fact, what really sparked it for me was, uh, if you recall, my first summer here, we had record heat wave the first week of school, and I was bombarded with emails, why don't we start after Labor Day? So that coupled with feedback I was getting about spring break and a proposed calendar, I thought, okay, pause. Let's ask our families and staff members. And based on that, we made some decisions like keep the first day of school before Labor Day. So um, the survey was part of our decision making. What we really haven't talked about is the teaching learning perspective of this, right? So, um, and I didn't realize that like, we were going to do deep dive on calendar, otherwise I would have done a full presentation on this. but. For me, um, having spring break earlier in April actually is a better teaching and learning um, perspective because APs start to happen like at the beginning of May. So for me, a kid coming back earlier in April has more teacher support and classroom support to ramp up to AP experience in May. There are some times that we have spring break late in April and kids are coming back from spring break and all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> APs, what? Um, so I actually, I like, um, spring break earlier in April because of the teaching and learning perspective, particularly at the high school level. 
Um, so that's one of the teaching and learning perspectives on having an earlier spring break. And I think um, this community, I, I guess, Ms. Griffin, maybe we can go back in the records. Like, how long have we had this practice of attaching spring break to a holiday? Um, there are some school systems that say second week of April, that's it. Doesn't matter what it is. Every year, second week. If we as a community want to do that, we can. Like, that, that's within our power. I would just ask that we keep it consistent so that we're not, parents don't have to guess when is spring break this year. If they know it's the second week of April, good, they can plan for it. If they know it's attached to um, Easter, then good, they can plan for it. I would just request as a board that we either continue the consistent practice or create a new one that will be consistent. So my recollection is consistency was you know, you, not just about around the calendar issue, but parents, they just want consistency. That's something that they historically would like to see. Um, and I know that, you know, we've talked to, we've, I think we've done in the last, I want to say, I mean, since I've been on the board, so since 2011, twice we, we've uh, surveyed on calendar. One of them, was a result of the, we had historic school cancellations one year that had us going to school so far into June because of storms. Yeah. Um, so we made adjustments to the calendar at that point to um, eliminate some of the, that's when we eliminated uh, Columbus Day and Veterans Day as school holidays and made them in, in school days. So um, this was the, the, second, the second recent survey that we've done was was it 2018 that we did it? Yeah, 2018. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of times parents are like, you know, it doesn't really doesn't really matter to me as long as there's consistency. I mean, that's they want to have that, and they want to have enough time to plan. That's the other the other piece. So, but, I mean, um, to speak to Ms. Pilicelli's concern, um, we also were responsive to the faith community when we left the uh, Jewish holiday observations in place. Mm -hmm. and, and before my time, we had I thought there was a conversation on removing those, but we had dialogue with that faith community and we were responsive and kept those in. So I do think that our faith community is part of our community. And it's not just the clergy. I mean, it's the, no. it's the community families, of that, right? It's families as well that have, um, based so it's on not their own one faith. faith community. But there were, there are places in our calendar that, that I think moving forward, to be fair, we likely need to have conversations about mm -hmm. other Correct. ethnic groups right. and, and I hope that will be part of our equity and engagement work mm -hmm. moving forward. I think from my perspective, it's kind of late in the game now to start making tweaks to what our consistent practice has been. I think as a board, if we want to um, have more dialogue about that for the future. That's something that we need to separate from this particular decision tonight and say, you know, whether we do or don't want to have further conversation. Um, you know, maybe it's something that we tie in with um, the uh, equity and engagement piece. And um, I, Ms. Missouri brought this up not too long ago, uh, asking about you know, what are, there are some other other holidays that school districts are starting to look at and implement. Um, so I think that's a broader discussion that, um, you know, maybe we do another survey in a year or two um, to see where people are at at that point. But I think that's a separate conversation from our decision tonight. I'm open to that conversation, particularly as we onboard our new supervisor. Um, I think it's part of a bigger conversation. Ms. Doyle? The last comment I have. I personally would have be uncomfortable with consulting with MEA, if you were to consult with MEA, to go for the calendar, because I think if you consult with MEA, you have to consult with every single union that we work with, because we are responsive to the entire district, not just the teacher union, and it is part of that administrative decision that we can go forward from there and discuss it from there, and I think surveying, if we were to go forward with the survey, it should be all encompassing staff, not touch teachers, but it's also custodians. It's also those in that space. It's not just the one we can be responsive to. Other comments? <coughs> Ms. Wilkwayton? Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to kind of just piggyback on both what Ms. Doyle and um, Ms. Glenn had said. I think that um, a lot of thoughtful and data-driven 
decision making went into the creation of the scandal of the scandal this <laughs> calendar um, I think we were extremely responsive and um, in taking many different perspectives into consideration um, and at this point it seems like the most prudent thing to do would be to move forward with this calendar taking a vote on it not necessarily making any changes to it now but having a conversation in our our goal to be more inclusive to be as responsive as possible perhaps you know in the coming year we do have a conversation about if there are some changes we want to make in the process so in the data I'm sorry in a data um, re based research I have the survey in front of me so only four years ago we had nearly 700 staff members respond so that, that's huge right uh, and the, the question was worded, so 70.5% staff of staff members said they wanted to continue with the traditional spring vacation that aligns with Good Friday. Only 19.5% said they wanted spring vacation at a different time in the month. And 10% actually had no preference. So if you add the 10% to the 70, 80% of, of 700 people responded saying, keep it with Good Friday. So I feel like we did ask. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to ask every year. No, we shouldn't. Yeah. We did ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I took the lead of our staff members. We kept it with Good Friday. So that's still my recommendation. The other, the other to me, the other thing we to point out is why shouldn't all the other districts change to what we want? So it's, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're implying that maybe we should be looking at other districts and doing what they are doing. It could be the other way around too. That they should be doing what we're doing. So you know, it, it, there's no wrong or right answer. I think being responsive to your own community is what's the most important, personal, right. personally. So, um, Ms. Uh, Petrovsky, do you have a motion? I do. I make a motion that the Milford Board of Education approves the 2023-24 academic calendar as presented by administration. There's second. I second. Mr. Um, Fowler has seconded. Is there any further discussion or comment? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Can we have a roll call, Ms. Griffin? Catherine Allen? Yes. Adam DeYoung? Yes. Megan Doyle? Yes. Andrew Fowler? Yes. Tracy Irby? Yes. Emily McDonough Souza? Yes. Gary Pelagetti? No. Una Petrosky? Yes. Cindy Wolf Poynton? Yes. And Susan Glennon? Yes. Motion passes 9 1. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, board members. Um, Dr. Kutaya, I don't see in your report. Any resources? So, um, Mr. Ficelli is going to review the HR report and take the additional two uh, agenda items as well. That's okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kutaya, and this is for any members of the board. Um, Mrs. Kapazman is out of town uh, tonight. Uh, an eight-year package, as usual, is um, her listings of the job postings, personnel changes, retirements, resignations, terminations, and stipend appointments. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions that you have. And if there's something that yeah, if there's something that we can't answer on the report, um, we certainly will get back to you on it. Questions from board members, Ms. Doyle. Um, I know we had discussed earlier about the athletic trainers, and I heard within the report earlier that there we had, uh, can you just give an update on where that situation is and just jog my memory if you can about sure. where we're going with that? Yes. Um, I, I believe we included um, an update in, in the Friday update several weeks ago. Um, but the, the, the trend right now is um, that, well, first of all, there's a shortage of athletic trainers. Um, I think I forwarded you the, uh, the long article that appeared in, in Hearst uh, publications, but um, it's been widespread. During the summer, uh, we lost our uh, athletic trainer at Jonathan Law. Um, and, and we've been uh, going to different private agencies, but it's, it's, we're not filling what we really need to fill. Um, so the, the position at Foreign, what prompted us to change to, from contracted services to um, uh, a full-time employee is the fact that um, the same thing was gonna happen at Foreign. Um, 
our athletic trainer who was there for about five years, and you, you heard during the student reports, she's a graduate of for, uh, foreign, um, and very dedicated, but she was lured away by another school district to go full-time in their district, and, and that's the trend right now. Um, and so we made that decision that if we were going to be able to um, provide the services that we need to provide to our student athletes, um, that we needed to change our model and go from contracted services to a full-time position. Um, we posted the position. Um, we received um, a good number of applicants at, uh, for both positions. Um, we had a committee of um, athletic directors, administrators, coaches, um, who, who did all the interviews, and um, we selected Hallie Zuckerman, who was the, the current um, uh, athletic trainer at Foreign, so she, she will be staying at Foreign. And um, we made an offer to another candidate uh, for the Jonathan Law position, and we heard this week that he's accepted the, um, the offer. So we will have full time, um, and you'll see reflected in the 23-24 budget, that um, there's a reduction in um, the uh, contracted services for that amount, and there's um, corresponding increase in the number of FDEs. Um, it's a, it, dollar wise, it's it's um, pretty much a wash because we had budgeted 140 thousand for the contracted service, and now we're we're um, budgeting 140 thousand for the um, FDE. Great, thank you. That's a long winded update. <laughs> no, but it's helpful. Thank you. Other questions on the Human Resources Report? I see none. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to the quarterly budget report. And um, as I told you, as, as I tell you, each quarter, um, although we report to you quarterly, we're watching the budget really every day, especially this time of year when, when we're, we've been engaged for the last several months in um, all things budget. Um, we're, we're, you know, carefully watching the numbers. So, um, at this point, we're at the halfway point of the year, um, and I will highlight a few areas that we have, I'll say concerns, but um, we have a plan in place, so I'm not going to call them major concerns, but areas where um, we continue to watch. Um, so, um, on your report, the, the biggest accountable of, of all, of course, is the 1111 certified teacher salaries. And we are right about where we normally are at this time of year. Um, so, so we're good there. Um, then down to account 1117, teacher substitutes. You will see that uh, we have a, a deficit. And we're projecting that we will have a deficit by the end of the year. Um, two reasons. One is. Um, we, we raised the rates to $140 a day um, in order to um, attract substitutes and be able to fill those positions. Um, and the other thing is we haven't, um, if you look down to line 3212, sub-teaching services interns, um, normally we have interns that we get from the local colleges of um, students who are um, want to go into teaching or in the education uh, field. Um, and we have those interns, and, and they uh, fulfill the role of the building substitute. We've had a hard time finding interns um, this year. And so um, we, we, as you can see, in 3212, um, we're going to have a surplus, which almost wipes out the, the deficit in teacher substitutes. So I just want to bring to your attention we will have, in that substitute line, we're spending more than we anticipated we would spend for those two reasons. Um, but we're not all that concerned about it because um, we will have a surplus in the sub-teaching interns line. Um, I mean, that's, that's a whole other issue with, with um, those you know, students who are going into education. Um, but that's, that's a topic for down the line. Financially, um, they kind of wash for our, for our purposes here. Um, I just bring your attention to uh, the paraprofessionals line, 1125, because you can see in Mrs. Kapazma's HR report, there are a number of para positions um, that are still vacant, um, and that's why there's a, 
you know, pretty conser considerable surplus um, because it's, we're finding it um, continue to be hard to find and retain paraprofessionals. Um, down to account 3302, legal services. Uh, and I mentioned this the last time um, when, when we had the quarterly report in October. Um, we, we're projecting a deficit in that account, and that is because uh, we have four uh, rounds of negotiations this year, the biggest, of course, being the teachers. Um, and um, in addition, as you know, there have been a number of uh, grievances that have come before your board um, and um, also some special education um, issues that need to, uh, legal advice and legal counsel. So we don't expect that next year is going to be um, like, like this. Next year we only have two um, contract negotiations and, um, and hopefully some of the things that we've been seeing in, in, as far as uh, hearings before your board hopefully will be reduced. So um, that's where we are with that one. On the second page, the um, 510102 and 03, as well as 5600, 5601, and 5602, um, those are the um, special education lines, and you'll see that they're all in deficit. But that's normal for this time of year. Um, as I've told the board before, those um, categories are eligible for the state's excess cost grant. And so we're hopeful that um, the majority of those deficits will be covered by the excess cost grant. Um, 5107, fuel for buses. Um, as we've been telling you, and as in the budget assumptions, um, the, the cost of, of diesel has been um, you know, astronomical. We've seen it come down a little bit. And one thing that's really gonna help us is that Durham is finally moving into their um, new location, or they have moved into their new location on Plains Road, so they will be able to use the, the uh, fuel tank that they have on site, and that way they can um, buy the, uh, the fuel wholesale as opposed to buying it uh, at the retail pumps where they, when they had, which they had to do when they were at the Connecticut Most Mall. So that, that's brighter, and, and the fuel cost coming down is brighter, so hopefully, um, you know, we're, we're through this um, very high um, fuel cost time period. Um, the last thing on, on the last page I just wanted to bring to your attention, it's, it's, it's fairly minor, um, but it represents a bigger problem that we're seeing. Um, account 7392, the capital equipment, um, that, that's one vehicle, and we had budgeted and we had quotes before this budget was enacted uh, for a vehicle at 56,164. And uh, when we went to purchase this this, this year, it uh, the cost of that same vehicle was 73,875. So that's one vehicle, a deficit of, of uh, 17,000, and roughly um, the inflation on that vehicle went up about a third of what we had budgeted for. So. As I said, it's, it's a small piece in our budget, but it's representative of things we're finding in other areas where um, the cost of the same things is much higher than it was last year and, and what we budgeted for. So with that, um, I will be quiet and answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Rich Kelly. Questions? Mr. DeYoung? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richtilly, just a question on um, account 1118 curriculum work. Mm -hmm. It looks like we haven't spent any money in that account. Is that typical for this time of year? Or? It is because we're, we're, we're a year behind, so the money that we spent on last year's curriculum work was in the previous year's budget. So this this money will be encumbered for this coming June, July, and August. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fowler? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richitelli, what, what is the vehicle? It's, it's a, um, a maintenance vehicle with, with the storage um, compartments on the side. It also has the full plow and uh, sander equipment on it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Richitelli. You're welcome. And the last item um, on the superintendent's report is the disbursements report. Um, as usual, you have in your package the listing of 
um, all disbursements um, for the month of December over the amount of $1,500, and those items attributed to COVID in yellow. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions on the disbursement report? Okay, I see none. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richtelli. All right, we move on. Uh, Dr. Kutai, that completes the report. Thank you. So we move on to new business approval of the working agreement. Um, Ms. Petrosky, do you have a motion? Yes, I make a motion that the Milford Board of Education approves the working agreement between Milford Board of Education and Milford School Security Guards Union, Local 1303, Council Number 4, AFSCME, AFL-CIO, July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2026. Is there a second? There's a second. Mr. Fowler has seconded. Do we have any um, comments or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Um, Ms. Petrosky, consent agenda. I'd like to make a motion that the Milford Board of Education approves consent agenda item December 12, 2022, business meeting minutes. Is there a second? A second. Mr. Fowler seconded. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Do we have any board comments this evening? Um, I just wanted to mention that I did attend a CAVE webinar um, this past week. Mr. Pellicetti also attended um, regarding uh, the reading legislation. Um, it was a webinar presented by the State Department of Education. Um, it was supposed to have questions and answers at the end, which it didn't. Um, I was just, it was a interesting, <laughs> an interesting um presentation. Uh, it wasn't it was supposed to be a discussion and it was not a discussion. Um, I will just say that uh, afterwards there was a lot of um, comments from board, other board chairs uh, through my listserv with voicing lots of disappointment on the way that it was handled, the fact that they didn't answer questions, if they had asked for questions in advance and then they didn't answer them. Um, they didn't offer um, an opportunity for much discussion, and there is a lot of frustration <coughs> on the board side as well over this proposed over this legislation and um, the actions that will be taken. I know we'll we'll hear more about it from Dr. Kutai in the months ahead. I'm sure, um, whether via a board meeting or our board updates, but um, there's a lot of frustration out there. So I just wanted to let you know that. All right. Um, no other comments. I would just say that the webinar was ultimatum disguised as debate. <laughs> well said. All right. Um, motion to adjourn, Ms. Petrasky. Motion to adjourn. A second. Second by Mr. Fowler. Um, there's no um, objections. We will adjourn at 827. See everybody on Wednesday, 7 p.m. on Zoom. On Zoom. I will send the agenda. <laughs>